Would you like to learn how to secure your cloud environment? If so, this video is for you. Hi, my name is Michael Gibbs, and I am the founder and CEO of GoCloud Architects and GoCloud Careers. And we're an organization that's dedicated towards building the most high-performance cloud computing careers. We specialize in building cloud architect careers and cloud engineering careers. Now, personally, I've been working in technology for over 25 years now, and I've been helping others get their first tech job or get promoted in tech for more than two decades. And I want to help you build your cloud computing career by either getting cloud hired or cloud promoted. In today's video, we're going to talk about how to secure your cloud environment, you may also think about it as in terms of how to secure your VPC if you're on AWS. If you're on Azure, you may think about this in terms of how to secure your VNet. In this video, we're going to get very deep in terms of high security, robust environments. We're going to go way beyond the types of things that are taught in a certification because those certifications are based upon vendor proprietary services, which don't work in a multi-cloud environment. And more importantly, when an organization or an enterprise needs critical security, the things that are taught in a certification are just not enough. You got to get robust and you got to use multi vendors and you got to use the best equipment in the world. And that's what we're going to talk about in terms of how to design your cloud environment, how to secure your VPC in this video. Now, in this video, we're going to talk about effectively a web application and how to secure that application. And we're going to be talking about it in terms of generic terms because I want you to know what to do on Google, AWS, Azure, Oracle, Nutanix, or any cloud. Now, when it comes to securing a web environment, we're going to have to use layers. It's going to be like an onion where we peel back the layers. And each layer affords a level of protection. So we're going to have multiple layers. Now, again, this is going to be a very robust environment. So how do we secure a web environment from the edge all the way through? It begins with a content delivery network. We're going to want to place a content delivery network at the edge of our network outside of our firewalls. And here's what the content delivery network is going to do. The content delivery networks are going to help protect us from various attacks, specifically DDoS attacks. And I'll explain what that is and how it works. In a distributed denial of service attack, what happens is a hacker takes a bunch of systems on the internet and compromises them and then uses all of them to launch a number of requests to the web servers or your systems. And what happens in the goal of this attack is to send so much traffic to your systems that they get overwhelmed and cease to function. Now, by using a content delivery network, we can really help protect against that. Now, it's going to take multiple layers, but it's still going to help, and here's the reason why. A content delivery network is a network of caching servers spread throughout the world. And by doing so, the content delivery network will really offload our web servers. So if our web servers can handle 5,000 requests a second, and we're getting 15,000 web requests per second, but the content delivery network is doing 13,000 of them, we still have the capacity left over for several thousand more. So under good circumstances, the content delivery network helps with scalability. But under a distributed denial of service attack, it helps a lot more, and we're going to talk about why. A content delivery network will only forward legitimate requests to the web server. Now, in a DDoS attack, what happens is users send half-open TCP connections or things that are not legitimate web requests but they take up resources in the web server and that's how they, they can really attack the server. But here's the great news, the content delivery networks will block all illegitimate requests from hitting the servers. So by doing that right then and there, we really can mitigate a lot of the DDoS attacks. Now also to make this better, the content delivery networks also offer some excellent DDoS protection services which can further enhance the security of your system. So we definitely want to use a content delivery network. Now, this could be an Akamai content delivery network, a Cloudflare content delivery network, uh, AWS CloudFront content delivery network, the Azure content delivery network. It really doesn't matter. We want to use a content delivery network for that purpose. Now, the next part of our architecture is going to be a next generation firewall, which is very different than the traditional firewalls. Let's explain what a firewall is first. Think of a firewall as a security device which keeps bad actors out. 
So pretending you were building a castle, the castle will have giant walls around the castle, and those walls keep bad actors from getting in. Now a traditional firewall does just that. It allows your return tra your traffic to go out to the internet and your return traffic to come in, but it blocks everything except for what you permit it. And that's your traditional firewall. And that offers a relatively good level of security, but it's not enough in today's environment, which is why we're not gonna use things like AWS Web, because we need something that's a next generation firewall, and we'll talk about what that does. So we talked about the castle walls, keeping bad actors out. And next generation firewall can also stop attacks as they occur. What happens is the next generation firewalls monitor your traffic, they see what's going on. They're kind of like your credit card. And if you try to spend money on your credit card in six countries in the same day, chances are your credit card's gonna be blocked. And the reason is your credit card company is gonna see a pattern of behavior that's not normal, and it's gonna stop it so you don't get in trouble. Well, a next generation firewall uses heuristics like that. It uses pattern matching or signatures, and it looks for the things that don't look normal, and it blocks it. So a next generation firewall really, really adds an extreme level of security above a traditional firewall. Now, next generation firewalls are made by lots of great organizations. Cisco makes them, Palo Alto Networks makes them, Fortinet makes them, Checkpoint makes them, and there's other great vendors as well. But these are your robust, strong firewalls that you would use for enterprise protection. Now, in the cloud, it's a little more complicated to use these, so we're gonna tell you how we do it. In the cloud, it's not like we can go and rack and stack our great firewalls like we would in the data center into the rack, plug them in, and we're good to go. And they're generally speaking from fairly high availability devices. On the cloud, we can't put something in the cloud provider's data center. So when it comes to dealing with next generation firewalls in the cloud, what we're dealing with as follows, virtual machines. And we're gonna be getting these virtual machines of this robust security architecture from the marketplace. AWS has a marketplace, Azure has a marketplace, all the cloud providers have a marketplace. And that's where we're gonna get these next generation firewalls. But a virtual machine is not a high availability device. So imagine your firewall is on a virtual machine and the virtual machine crashes. Poof, done, you're out. So we can't do that. So what can we do? Well, we can use multiple next generation firewalls and we can put a network load balancer in front of those firewalls. Now, AWS has an option to use a gateway load balancer, but a network load balancer works great. And for the rest of the cloud providers, we're gonna be using network load balancers, so we're gonna be using a network load balancer here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a load balancer in front of our firewalls and they're gonna run a health check. Firewall one, are you there? Firewall two, are you there? And if one of the firewalls doesn't respond, they'll be removed from the rotation and we still have availability. So at the edge of the network, we're gonna block all kinds of illegitimate stuff with the content delivery network. And we're gonna keep bad actors out with the firewall. And should they come in, we're gonna stop them in their tracks with the adaptability and the internal intrusion detection prevention systems of the next generation firewall. So at this point, we've got somewhat robust security, but it's nowhere close to enough. So let's talk about how to make it better. Now, remember I talked about a castle and the walls, that's your firewall. Now imagine the castle typically has this moat that's filled with litter, and I don't know whether it's filled with sharks or alligators or some kind of dangerous animals. And at the other side of the moat, you've got knights with like swords and things like that protecting the castle. Now we're gonna use another set of intrusion detection prevention systems. And to me, the intrusion prevention and detection systems are the scary animals in the moat, like the sharks, as well as the knight that's gonna make sure that nothing bad gets through. Now, why would we use another set of intrusion detection or intrusion prevention systems when that functionality is already on our firewalls? We're gonna do it for the following reason. Intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems give us extremely good information as to what's going on because they're monitoring the traffic, they're watching everything. So it's gonna give us some excellent, excellent, excellent information, which we'll talk about later how to use that in our run. But, but more importantly, you know, we've got one firewall, but what if it misses? It's intrusion detection, so we want a second backup. You know, if you break, break one, you might not get past the second one. So that's why we're gonna use a second set of intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, and I call it a second set because some of that functionality is enabled in the next generation firewall. Now, where are we gonna get these intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems? The marketplace, which means they're gonna be on virtual machines, which means virtual machines are not high availability, so we're gonna use a network load balancer. So what's it look like so far? At the edge of the network, we've got a content delivery network to, to stop a lot of the DDoS attacks. Then we have two multiple next generation firewalls behind a load balancer. 
to keep bad actors out and thwart attacks in their tracks. Then we've got another load balancer front ending two more intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, so we can block anything that got let through so far. But that's nowhere near enough. Now, we need to protect the subnets where our servers are. Here's the great news. We can use an access control list. Whether you call it a network access control list or an access control list, here's the key. It's a basic packet filter that will keep unwanted traffic out of your subnet. So what do we have so far? Got our content delivery network, we got our firewalls, our intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, and an access control list. Of course, that's not enough. So let's talk about what we're going to do next. We want to basically protect the servers. And in the cloud, we've got the opportunity to do something like a security group, which is basically a firewall for your server. It's a cloud provider's firewall for your server. And by doing this, we can allow only the traffic we want into the server and block everything else. Hmm. Now we're starting to get into some robust security, but it's not enough. So content delivery network, firewalls, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, access control lists, and security groups. Now let's talk about the web servers. OK, we've got to do something here. Ideally, we can stick another host-based firewall on our servers ourselves, and that way, if anything breached everything else, we're good to go. So let's talk about anti-malware. Worms, viruses, et cetera, et cetera, they exist in the reality. So we want to put some endpoint protection or anti-malware protection on every server that we have. Now, here's the reality. No matter how good we do things, there's always going to be a new vulnerability. So we need to make sure our teams have a patch management schedule and we can patch the systems as soon as we find out about serious vulnerabilities to make sure that we're not open to hacking. Now, we still need to do some more on the servers. When you boot up a Windows system, a Mac, a Linux system, you'll note if you do a netstat on them, you're going to see a lot of ports that are open because these systems boot up with a lot of service heads to help you with a lot of things. But if you're a web server, for example, you only need to be a web server and you don't need all those services open. And every one of those services is a TCP IP port that's open that can be used to hack. So we need to disable the unnecessary services so we can close off all those ports. Now, if we have any data on the web servers, we really want to encrypt that with SHA-256 bit encryption. And what we should actually put on is an auto-scaling group on our servers, and I'm going to explain to you why it's going to help dramatically with DDoS protection. So if we had a DDoS attack where we're trying to overwhelm the server, let's say the server can deal with 5,000 requests a second, and the server were to get 15,000 web requests a second that weren't caught by the content delivery network. Clearly, we have much more traffic than the web server can handle. So basically what's going to happen is the web server is going to crash and we're not going to get any information to anybody. But imagine if we put that web server in an auto scaling group. And as a DDoS attack came in and we're at 3,000, 4,000 web requests, we start adding servers on demand. We may be able to withstand the DDoS attack long enough to do something about it. So we always want to put our web servers in an auto scaling group because it can be a big help. Now let's talk about something else. Let's talk about determining who our users are, what the users can do, and then tracking them. So right now we talked about everything that's completely keeping systems out of the web server. But now we're part of identity and access management, otherwise known as authentication, authorization, accounting. And I'll explain that to you very simply. Authentication, who are you? Authorization, what can you do in accounting? What have you done? Now, in most environments, we're going to use Microsoft Active Directory, and we're going to federate that with our cloud, because it's going to be a scalable solution. Identity access management is only once they've gotten there. So let's pretend our web server is, that, is, is really that what's inside the castle. We've already blocked it with the CDN, the firewalls, the IDS, IPS systems, the access control list, the security group, and all the things on the server. So at this point, now somebody's knocking on the door, which means they had to breach everything you've had so far. So here we want to make sure that we have users that can sign in. If we need users that can sign in, that they've been given the principle of least privilege, meaning only access to what they need and nothing more. I've always preferred the principle need to know, as the military calls it, meaning if you don't need to know it, you don't. And that further secures your systems. Now at this point, we've got a really, really radically critical robust security system, which is enough for pretty much anybody. But let's enhance it just a little more. As you can imagine, our firewalls, our IDS IPS systems, our VPC flow logs, or the equivalent like Cisco NetFlow, every cloud provider has it. 
we've got a lot of information of the traffic that's going on. And all our systems log, 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 log. Now, if we can look in those logs in real time, we can get really good information. So many organizations that are at the high end of security will do the following. They'll take their system logs from all these systems and they'll put them into our streaming data services. So AWS has their proprietary Kinesis. Everybody has something. We recommend Apache Kafka and that way you can use this on multiple clouds. So we'll take our system logs, we'll put them into Apache Kafka and then we'll put them into a visualization tool like Tabulo. And now we can literally see in real time what's going on in our systems. And that way we can monitor things, change things much, much, much faster. So we love this environment. We like to use visualization whenever possible. So now you know how to secure your systems from end to end in a critical security environment. We talked about how to secure your cloud environment, how to secure your VPC, how to secure your VNet, and this architecture will work on any cloud, the AWS cloud, the Oracle cloud, the Azure cloud, the Nutanix cloud, the OpenStack cloud, and guess what? For the most part, it'll work in any data center as well. Now you know how organizations with mission critical security needs secure their environment. This is Michael Gibbs, and I look forward to seeing you in another video. Take care of you.